Right, so, concept design for board games by me. Um, so I'm wearing a few different hats today. Uh, I'm wearing my Where to Workshop uh, Senior Concept Artist hat, um, and I'm definitely representing a very large group of people um, that worked on the board game GKR Heavy Hitters. Um, there was a very small team of us for the most of the time, but like in all things at Weta, a much larger group of people touch it um, at various different times, and so I'm sort of acknowledging all of their hard work. Um, I'm also a course supervisor, along with Tanya, on the master's program um, up at, uh, which is the Weta Workshop School up at Massey University. Uh, and so I've been doing that now for a couple of years. Uh, I'm also a freelance artist and art director. I also do a little bit of consultancy work um, on creative development. Uh, and finally, um, uh, a couple of years ago, myself and Nicola Booth, who I worked on with GKR, uh, we started up our own little games company called Arcus, um, and I'm the creative director, and we just uh, delivered our first game. Um, we've got a few in the development. Right, so, ripping into it. Disclaimer, I am not a game designer. If I say stuff about game design that contradicts very educated people that you've been talking to at this conference, probably listen to what they're saying and not me. Um, I have been working in board games for about six years now. Um, I've worked on about half a dozen video games over my time at Weta, mainly on AAA games, usually in quite a very specialist kind of way, like designing characters or something like that. I'm not usually involved in the minutiae of running a game, a video game. I have worked on lots and lots of film and TV projects over my nearly 20 years at Weta. So I'm definitely coming at this from a film, television centric side of things. So let's get the obvious out of the way, gameplay. Art and design needs to be in support of this. Um, and so that's the, you know, that's the cardinal rule at some level. However, um, one of the things that um, I discovered working in games, um, video games and board games, was that the usual process is that there is the game design and then you effectively skin the creative onto the game design. Um, I'm not sure if that's typical, but it seems to be what I've encountered the most. Um, and to be honest, I didn't enjoy the process as much as being like we had on GKR, where it was more of a collaborative approach between creating the world of GKR and riffing off the game design and going back and forth and challenging each other's ideas around what makes a good game. Um, and so, and of course, we were a bunch of film concept designers, and so we were taking a very cinematic approach to designing a board game because that's what we knew. Um, even though we played board games plenty of times, as designers, we were definitely taking a cinematic approach. So today's talk is kind of, to be honest, it's just some observations around what we've learnt along the way, and maybe some of this is transferable to you guys for video games or if you've got interest in making board games. Um, but, but it's just some observations, so I'm not sort of coming out and saying this is right, this is wrong. So obviously the goal of a board game and a video game is to entertain. We're not saving lives, we're just hopefully entertaining people. Um, but for me, it's really important that we do that in a meaningful and hopefully a fairly original way. Um, for me, uh, growing up, Jim Henson was a huge inspiration, someone who could, was incredibly creative and made these amazing imaginary worlds, but was also very passionate about telling relevant stories and being an educator. Um, and so that's something that I've always carried with me with my projects. Um, and when I saw Brian Froud's work in The Dark Crystal, I realised for the first time how a single artist can have such an incredible impact on one creative project, which was a real eye-opener. Um, and so that's something I've always tried to bear in mind when I work on my projects. So concept design for film, before I can dive into the board game stuff, I just need to really quickly cover off I guess my take on my experiences in designing for um, film. And so this is a bit simplistic, but I'm just gonna try to boil it down to my general approach, it's kind of what I teach as well, um, which is that concept design is in service to the creative vision. Um, and so say on a film, that's typically the director, um, and should be in support of story, world, and character. Not, and they, I mean, I think generally, I think like if it's a film, usually stories at the top, and then, you know, world and character kind of, kind of is a little bit interchangeable. But at the end of the day, as a designer, 
what my job is, is to support those things in support of the creative vision. The challenge is the creative vision, sometimes you have no clue what it is. Like, you, you, unless you're gonna sit down in a meeting and have a chat with the director, which I have sometimes, but a lot of the times you don't get access to the creative vision. You don't even get access to the script half the time, which means you end up playing a bit of a detective. You start having to work out what is the creative vision. And because it's super important that you start, because your job as a concept designer is to actually start to make that vision, literally build it, or make it a reality. So I've just got one example of film work per each one of these, and then we're ripping into board games. I'm gonna, and I'm just going to do a real sort of shotgun version of it, not the in-depth explaining to a client version of how the, the, the concept works. So the first one is story. This was a key scene. Um, it was actually really just the brief was, this was obviously Blade Runner 2049. The brief, uh, what does the Wallace building look like? We know it towers over the Terrell building, but what does it look like? Um, that's all good and fine, and I'm interested in what it looks like, but what I'm really interested in is how's the audience meant to feel when they see it, and more importantly, how can we lean into the themes of the original film and the themes of the new film so that this building has a level of um, significance and conceptual underpinning. And so what I was trying to do in this image is in the original film, um, you know, the speeder goes through this, and basically this kind of like industrial hell with the Torreal Pyramid in the distance, which is kind of like a metaphor for human technology has become God, basically, has become religion. Um, I wanted to flip it this time, and the, the flyer flies over basically kind of like a paradise. And you realise it's the complete opposite to the opening sequence for the first film. And you think, wow, I think they've finally achieved it, they've finally got there. Um, but then, of course, they drop below the pollution line, and you're back into kind of like the reality. And so I was playing with this Paradise Lost kind of concept. And I was also playing with the idea that Wallace was effectively trying to attain immortality. And of course, replicants kind of are immortal, uh, immortal except for their built-in use-by date. So that's the kind of, and this kind of, this is exactly what I wrote to the director with my design. I would always unpack it so that they got it. Uh, Kay's apartment, uh, the brief, what does Kay's apartment look like? That's all I got, and that's all of us got. Um, so he's an artificial, he's a Blade Runner. We know he's artificial, he's a replicant. So this concept was, let's try to lean into that and make his apartment as sterile and aesthetically pleasing, but very sterile. Like, just no, he basically doesn't have a life. It's kind of very sterile. No clutter, no kind of sense of friendship or family. The only light in his life is literally his holographic girlfriend, Joy. So... Um, now, that's not the direction they went in, but that was my concept. And I was rooting it within the character of who he is and trying to lean into that to help the storytelling. Uh, for Ghost in the Shell, a couple of Yakuza's. Um, I was hoping to do the third one, but never got the chance. Um, these were just background characters, but I thought it would be fun to try to make them a little bit more significant, give them a bit more of a stronger, iconic identity because they were background characters. I played off the idea of hear no evil, see no evil and lent into the Japanese tradition, uh, Yakuza tradition, um, but playing with color and shape language and really going to town on it because make a big splashy statement because we probably only see these guys for a few seconds before they're brutally murdered. So that's kind of the day job for film design. Um, how the heck do you apply some of those principles to board games? So story, elevator pitch, getting your story straight the elevator pitch is not just something you use in an elevator. You use it as a really good tool to test whether your idea sucks or not. If you can't summarize your idea and make it and convince someone, anyone, that it's cool, what's the point in continuing on with it? It's the same with board games, right? You want a high concept for a game, you've got to succinctly be able to sell it and then ask yourself, is that actually any good? Because if it's not, well, you need to go back to the drawing board. So for Giant Killer Robots, it's kind of what's on the box, and it's basically Giant Killer Robots fighting to recycle cities, old cities. Um, and the sort of where we were targeting it, if you love anime and manga and giant robot properties, but you also like our live action films that we've worked on, like Chappie, um, District 9, we're gonna bring you something like that, but in a board game experience. Uh, for Shelfie Stacker, it's a board game about collecting board games. It's it's a meta, it's a love letter to the board game community. It's a meta project. 
if you like board games and you like collecting board games, and even better, if you like taking photos of those board games and putting them onto Instagram, then you're the people we want for this game. Um, and again, uh, from an art direction perspective, we really, we really wanted to go to town with our characters. Like we, the board game community is incredibly diverse and fun and interesting. And we really wanted to find an art style that, that gave us some freedom around that, to push, push parody and archetype a little bit. Um, and so, again, we were kind of enjoying, you know, me and Claire are huge fans of anime and manga. And so, again, we sort of liked leaning more into that than the realistic sort of illustration style. So, visual storytelling. Um, with GKR, the weird thing was we got approached to basically skin a game with a world IP and then we found out there was no game. There was just this idea of a game. And so we were like, hmm, okay, well, you guys need to sort that out. Um, while you're doing that, we'll try to sort out the IP. So we locked ourselves in a room for a week, literally, and came up with the whole concept. Um, and so the three of us basically, we kind of backed and forth between writing and uh, visual storytelling. One of the, and because we're, you know, we like showing pictures, so we very quickly started to um, visualize some of our story beats and the, the concept that was gonna, we hope, drive the game. Christian did these, uh, Christian Pierce. Uh, so this was like a little timeline. There was a whole bunch of these that just explained the chronology of our world. This is, we call it, where do we call this getting down the universal laws, which is basically like world logic. So that when you start playing in the world or showing the world, you're consistent. Um, from there, we sort of leapt into comics, um, partly because we love comics, but also because we kind of thought that comics could be a way of unlocking a lot of really interesting design approach from a branding perspective. So we started working, this is the final product, well actually there was a coloured version, but this was kind of the final product, but we did much cruder earlier versions that let us start to explore our world visually and start to find a visual language that kind of gelled with us. Um, and the purpose of that in an ideal world, and this is where my colleague Larry, who was the other co-creator, Larry Greer, he's all about direct transmission. And this is the concept here is, if you can sell your whole concept in one image, if you can find that image, that's it, you've done it. If, or get as close as you can. And so that's what we were always striving for, is finding an image that sold everything about this world that you need to know at some level. And it took a while to find those images, but we started getting pretty close. And you can see that the comic immediately spawned into um, promotion images. It was used, we did a bit of a 3D hack job to get into our Kickstarter video. But more importantly, you can see how that aesthetic is now drifting into the, the, the componentry of the game. There are other stories. You may, your board game may have no narrative whatsoever. That's really common, right? A non-narrative board game. But that doesn't mean you can't still have fun with narrative. There is a story. It's you as a creator. So you can, and I mean, a big part of getting a board, a game off the ground is getting people to believe in it, which means that they have to like you. So how do you get people to like you other than giving you, you know, giving them lots of money? So with, with us, well, we had some street cred from the film industry, but we had zero cred from a games industry perspective. And we were very aware of that. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't come across as the know-it-alls from film making a game. So the first thing we did is what we always do, because we're not particularly serious people, is we took the piss out of ourselves. And we made a point of kind of having fun with that, that we were just basically a, a bunch of goofballs having a lot of fun creating this really cool world and this really cool game. And that, that's the honest truth, we were. Um, and so, but we kind of leaned into that because it was a fun thing to do. We didn't want to um, appear arrogant or cocky coming into this kind of um, this this kind of community. And part of what we wanted to do was to earn our stripes. And probably the hardest thing that we did, which I didn't do, because I stayed in LA and stayed with my friends who got a swimming pool. Um, poor old Larry and uh, Johnny and I, they did a road trip across the southern states in scorching 50 degree heat visiting little wee board game stores and play testing our game with brick and mortar stores because we thought that that was the best way to get honest feedback from the people that are gonna be buying our game. And man, did we get so much good feedback from that. So it, for us, it was so good that we made the effort to actually not only 
make the game, play test it, but actually take it on the road. Um, so it was a really cool experience. Um, lean into your skill set. Um, you know, like, even if it's a bit of an unobvious one, Ike was a stunty. He's a stuntman. That's when he wasn't doing all the marketing stuff for us, he was a stunt guy. So just, you know, we thought, well, how can we have some fun with that? So we end up just doing this photo shoot just for a laugh to have some fun. So, but the thing is, everyone's got some really diverse skill sets. You might not think that they're applicable for what you're doing, but that's the trick. A lot of them are. You've just got to be creative around how you tap into them. Um, for Shelfie Stacker, kind of a little bit similar in that we, we were a startup company. It was our first game. It was very much a love letter to the board game community, but we were kind of doing a bit of a parody as well. So what we were wanting to do is put ourselves into the game, literally. Um, and also, some of the characters are based off us. We're taking the piss out of ourselves. So Upgrade Ad was based off Claire, my, my wife, who was doing most of the character designs, and I was rendering them up. Um, that was me back when I was 18 and a heavy metal with a mullet. So it's just, it's just having fun the whole time as much as possible, and most importantly, trying to show that you're having fun, which I think is really important. People like that. I like seeing people having fun being creative, and I kind of want to share that I'm having fun as well. So with us, if the story, we've got our story straight, but what's the plot? And a plot is when you order your story around to make it thematic, dramatic, emotional, and have significance. And so for us, it was first things first, great gameplay. Second thing was go full meta. Third thing was entertaining at every level. Like this is literally the, the date we launched our Kickstarter. Like every detail we, we tried to have fun with. And finally, delicious design, trying to make it literally edible. Um, and how that plays out with story, world, and character, we wanted to engage, retain, and entertain. So the story, we wanted to reference a lot of popular culture and gaming culture stuff in our game. From a world perspective, well, it's the board game community and popular culture. And finally, to entertain people. And this is the big thing is, you know, we wanted to keep people entertained even when it wasn't their turn. So we wanted to start doing a little bit of a Easter egg hunt in some of the artwork to keep, um, which was a little bit of a parody of gamer stereotypes. So that's kind of the approach we took with um, Shelfie. So for World, this is um, Dreadful Meadows. This is our game that we, we're hoping to announce in October, so you guys are getting a little bit of a sneak peek. This is still artwork in progress. Um, so the world, in board game terms, is the table and whatever goes on it to play the game. Uh, and so for me, I solve a lot of the, the branding and look of the game uh, with often the board. This is one of the first things we did on GKR as well, was try to visualize the board, the table, and how everything looks on it. One of the things I really like to do too, from a storytelling perspective, is put something onto the board that lets you literally explain the idea of the game and then the gameplay. So, for, instance, for example, you know, quite a bit of real estate here for just one big illustration with nothing to do with the components, but this is how it works. Dreadful Meadows. It's a uh, creepy land, um, filled with four creepy confectioners that are all competing to create, um, to be this season's sweetest supplier, Halloween, and harvest the most candy, you know, these supernatural candies. So that's kind of, and I didn't explain that very well because I haven't got my sales pitch down yet, but the idea is though, is that that's, you can literally talk your way through the world on the board game. And that's super useful when you're play testing. You know, you just sit down at the table and you can immediately talk your way through it. The other great thing is that that sets you up for the Kickstarter video, because now you can focus on telling that story through the Kickstarter video, which is super useful. GKR, um, contrast is key. Uh, one of the first things we noticed when we looked around at board games was, wow, a lot of color, a lot of color, and a lot of busy. So we went, okay, let's, let's play with this. Let's be the opposite. So the only color we used was factions. Anything in color is factions, Anything that's kind of background gameplay, location, world, anything like that is grayscale. So we're color controlling. We're using color control to um, strip, to make an impact. And the other thing we noticed was that everyone does horizontal board games. No one goes vertical. So the first thing we did was start playing with vertical buildings. We, you know, they're trashing cities. It's a, it's a demolition party. So let's go high with those buildings. This was the best, this was probably the greatest win we got on the game of getting that across the line because we had a lot of pushback that, about it, but we were determined to see it through. You can see kind of like, you know, we're always referencing films. You know, this is basically SimCity. It's 
of isolated colours, or and when you use colour, like we're hugely influenced by Akira, so poppy colour, use real neon sort of bright stuff if you're going to use it. Table presence, same thing. Um, the big thing to get here is that effectively we are square. Like we tried to, use, we even explored square cards for quite a while. It just got a little bit too complicated. But the iconography on the cards is square. Pretty much everything is square, 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 square. And you just ride that shape language home as much as possible. You let it infiltrate across the whole game. If you can, if you can ride something like that, ride it all the way home. With GKR, the shape language was each faction had a unique shape language, and we the robot designs would lean into that. So we would use shape language as a factional um, concept. But in this, it was all about shelves, dice. We even did custom dice where it's looked like little boxes when you put them on the shelf. And the other important thing is getting physical. At Weta, well, we, we build stuff. So <laughs> you design something, you prototype it. That's this, and board gaming's the same, right? Except we were quite keen to play with some of the prototyping we use in the film industry. So we were starting to 3D mill some of the components. We love the idea that people were actually fill a real shelf. We found out that people actually found it a real pain in the butt and they would just push it, push it forward. So we decided, no, that's probably not the way to go. But we ended up doing these really cool little um, double layer punch boards so that you still had that physical satisfaction of putting something into something rather than just sitting it on top. So tactility is a big thing with board games over video games. That, that sense of physical tactileness, like holding something, rolling something, the sound that dice make, all of that stuff kind of counts. Character. Uh, so when you go to Disneyland or any of those theme parks, which and we've done a little bit of theme park design, you sit in queues and you get bored. And the trick is at Disneyland, they try to keep you entertained while you're waiting. With board games, it's a little bit of a similar problem that if you've got a gameplay that leaves characters sort of to their own devices for a while, they can get a little bit bored waiting for their turn, especially if you're playing with that person that just takes forever to make a decision. It sucks, right? So we thought, okay, we'll build some gags in to keep people entertained, like a Disneyland queue. So for us, it was all about um, parody and layered engagement. So we want to just build jokes, gags within gags within gags. And so our formula was find an archetype like Bad Lender, the guy, the person that you lend a game to, and if it ever comes back, it comes back. You don't want it back. Find a, find a game trope in board games and lean into it, and then maybe find something in popular culture. So, and then roll it all together into an illustration and a character. So there's our Bad Lender, and he's playing, you know, I'm playing a little bit of a gag in the background. Sod throw, good night, I think I still see dead people. So in other words, he's a stoner like Shaggy, but he's like this kid, he sees dead people. Um, so just little jokes like that, and also, you know, ripping off zombie side. And when I say rip off, I mean homaging. Um, because I love those games. Like, we wanted to show how much we loved other people's board games. Uh, Kickstart is a huge thing in board games. We wanted to have a bit of fun with that. This was the upgrade addict, the person that just can't help themselves keep upgrading their Kickstarter. And then those boxes finally turn up, and you're literally going insane. So this was kind of our process. Claire would do some sketches. I would kind of do a gag pass on it, and then we'd bring it all together. And that was just half of our cast of characters for the game. Um, but you can sort of, if you're a big board game fan or a film person, you'll probably hopefully pick up a few references. Some of them are pretty obvious. We had to get a cat in there for expanding kittens. Um, so just having fun with the, with the community and the games. Um, character dynamics. Obviously, players like playing a certain way. Um, sometimes you want to give them a character that challenges the way they play or leans into it. So when we design for film, obviously character design, a huge part of it is the dynamic. Um, when we were thinking about our GKR characters, the first thing we thought of was anything that had four characters. So we were thinking of all those fun, sort of slightly cheesy sort of properties that we grew up on, like Ghostbusters, The A-Team, Scooby-Doo. Seinfeld's a particularly good one, because if you look at those if you look at those dynamics, it's fascinating to see how they interrelate and how they play off each other. And so, effectively, what we did was try to create a similar matrix for our four characters. Um, and then, you know, this was a very early pass. Then Christian taking it, and we, you know, in film industry, we just work across each other all the time. So we're just slowly trying to find our characters. We're exploring age range. Um, ethnicity, um, 
background, character backgrounds, trying to find a really interesting set that would kind of... Because to be honest, we were in our heads, we were making a, an animated TV series. Like, GKR was just a board game that we wanted to do, but the next step was an animated TV series. So we were putting in that kind of effort at this level because that was the dream, but also knew that it would make for a more interesting board game. One of the things... The original game had no characters in it. It was just robots. But we're of the opinion because we think characters are so important and that people gravitate towards characters, we wanted to put characters into the game specifically because we wanted people to engage. And I think, you know, you do engage with robots to a certain level, but I think you engage more emotionally with people. And so that was the, um, the hope there. Uh, this is from Dreadful Meadows. Uh, the last thing I want to touch on with characters is cultural design. And by that, I don't just mean an ethnicity. I just mean the fact that people form groups and then they define themselves through design. So that's just, just who we are. It's what we've been doing it from day one. So one of the things you, I like to do is, is to take that level of thought and care when I'm designing characters to go beyond just the character design, but even potentially the ornamentation, um, the graphic design, really spilling it. So this is kind of my horror take on a little bit Art Nouveau, I guess but throwing in a little bit of, uh, I don't know, sort of hot rod kind of style artwork as well. There's a lot of different influences here. So um, Claire did the character designs, and I'm doing the graphic design and art direction. And then spilling that, being very consistent by spilling that into the other components is the other thing as well. Um, this is not, so the last couple of points don't tie directly to story world and character. They are just about some, some things which I think you should always be aware of. The art of the reuse, we did this so much on GKR, and we definitely copied it on Shelfie Stacker as well. If you think, if you plan ahead, um, if you plan ahead early, you can identify how you can reuse artwork through your whole camp, right through everything, right from start to finish, right through to marketing. Um, and if you go in with that mindset, you can be very efficient and you can save yourself a lot of time and hassle. So right from, as soon as we conceived of this character, I knew that that was a character we were going to use on the Kickstarter. Because, I mean, obviously. So, but then it's just how, com how many times can we reuse that piece of artwork or deconstruct that piece of artwork and put it onto other things that fill up the game. So the art of the reuse is very, very useful. Right, can we just, have we got time to show the video? Let's just show the Kickstarter video we did for Shelby Stacker. It's like a minute long, so you hang in there. You love collecting games? Love sharing your shelfies? Well, now you can do both. Introducing Shelfie Stacker a one to four player game that puts you against your friends to create the most insta-awesome shelfie by stacking your shiny new games into the most snappable selection in your custom shelves. To aid you in your quest for shelfie stardom, let's introduce you to your band of stacking buddies. These usual suspects each have a special characteristic to help you stack your way to success. The game is played over seven rounds with eight characters in hand and begins with the arrival of your latest purchases from our, well, mostly reputable shipping companies. Each round, one player acts as the courier, filling each box with an assortment of guilt-free games for the group to choose. Each player then selects a stacking buddy from their hand, then all reveal, with the lowest number going first to collect their gaming booty. Using cards that are in play, start stacking your games to build the best shelfie you can. You got one dice that just won't fit? Then suck it up and consign that game to the shelf of shame. With everyone's turn done, it's time to reset for the round and go again. But wait, there's more. To ensure endless hours of in-depth play, each game comes with a combination of three terrific reward cards. Come the end of round seven, it's time to see who stacks up, tally the points, and then set the record straight to see whose shelfie shines. So the Kickstarter video is super important because, you know, it's in board games at the moment, it's pretty much your main sales technique. And I don't know if you guys picked up on it, but we very much, the, the guy that produced that video is a total genius, uh, Chris Williamson. He, it's a cinematic, it's totally cinematic. It's handheld, right? It's, it's all lots and lots of camera tricks. 
to get across something a bit different because most Kickstarter videos, board game Kickstarter videos are not like that. And we got a lot of positive feedback from the community about just how interesting that was from the normal video. Because at the end of the day, you still got to explain gameplay and all the rest of it. But Chris kind of just came up with an amazing um, sort of aesthetic for showcasing all the cool stuff that we've put in. So in terms of a team, very small team, just really the game designer, myself, Nicola and Claire, and then bringing in Chris for the, um, for the video. So that's basically the triggers. If you, if you think about cinematic right from the start, and you even start writing your screenplay, like I was writing the Kickstarter screenplay, like the copy for the video, like within the first two months of the game, working on the game, I was already thinking about how we were gonna sell it on the video. So just thinking about how important it is to think about that video. The last f final thing that I wanna cover off, which, can you advance for me? It's not, sorry. There we go. Ooh. Um, the last thing I just want to mention is holistic design. This talk was going to be called holistic design. I knew no one would turn up if I said that because effectively people would think is this some kind of health thing, health and body and mind thing. Um, it's not. But everything that I do, everything that most of the designers I know, the really good ones do, is holistic design. It's effectively the ability to take that bird's eye view and step beyond the little tiny bit that you're delivering and step back and understand how the picture that everyone's building together and getting a sense of that and how the bit that you're doing is going to work into that. Um, and I can't stress how important it is that you take that mindset into, into anything that you do creatively because most of us are working in teams. We need to understand how that works as a whole. Um, and the really cool thing too is that it's about the needs rather than the wants. Quite often a client wants something, but what they want is not what they need. It's usually up to you to work out what they need. Um, right, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's the sneak tease. It's one of uh, that's a game I've been working on for three years, which might be finished next year. Um, but uh, here's hoping. Uh, but um, thank you very much for listening, and I really appreciate the turnout. To be honest, I'm kind of amazed. So thank you so much. If there's any questions, I'm just going to pop outside, but if any of you guys have any questions, by all means, um, just grab me or you can just contact me by email.